The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. I think it's something that comes with growing older, but I find myself reminiscing more or trying to remember certain things maybe from the past. And one of the things that um, came to me during this last week, and it's probably a lot because it's January and February, was something that happened as a part of my childhood growing up in, um, in a home of a John Deere dealer. About every January and February, somewhere in there, they would plan what was called John Deere Night. And for some of you, you may have grown up going to that or had gone yourself. But it was a night that all the customers would be invited to come to wherever they were located at the time, and they would have usually some kind of a meal. There would be um, the introduction of all the employees who were not in their mechanic clothes, but in real clothes. I guess that's why they had to introduce them. I don't know, but anyway. um, and people would come, there would be free gifts to, to be had, and the, I can remember the Lincoln Elementary Gym just being full of people there in chairs and in the bleachers. The one thing that was going to happen every year was a movie. And that movie was always about newest things that were going on in the world of farming. It may, may be techniques, but usually, of course, it was a John Deere film. It was going to be about new tractors or new equipment or new ways to use those, those new implements in the world of farming. And every year, people would look with great anticipation to what was going to be in that movie. And you can imagine some people sitting there going, rolling their eyes like they couldn't believe that they'd come up with that. But I can remember seeing them go from four row equipment to eight rows to 16 rows. You know, you could just keep seeing these things grow over the years. But I think probably one of the most phenomenal things I can remember was the balers. When we went from square, small square balers to the first time I saw a big round baler. Now some of you may remember what that was like also. Some of you may have been the ones who used to be hired to go out and buck the bales. It was a summer job. It was a way in which you made a little bit of spending money. When that big round baler came around, it was going to take away a lot of those jobs out there for high school students. But that big round baler also meant some other things for people. It was was a new way in which they could work. It was a new way in which they could feed their cattle. It was a new way in which they could store the hay that they'd baled. There was a lot of excitement about that. But as you can imagine, there were also those who complained about that or griped or said it's just another way that they're trying to sell another implement and we don't really need it after all. Now, about 40 years later, as you drive up and down the roads, you can see the effect that that big round baler has had on the life of farming. It may have taken its time, but it becomes now a need. There's still a need for the, for the square bales as well. And people who need those will bale their hay both ways. You see both of them live together 
in whatever needs are, are needed. Innovation, information, implementation are necessary in the world that we live in. How a person farms can only be determined by the opportunity one has or chooses and then uses. Whatever the choice, whatever the method, whatever the tools that are used to accomplish the job, all of these decisions are based on what the person has heard or chosen to hear and then believed. We have such a situation today in, in our gospel lesson. Jesus has gone to Capernaum and is teaching in a synagogue. And those gathered are astounded, astonished at his teaching. Now I have to confess, I went to the dictionary because I kept looking at this word astonished and astounded and I said, just what does that mean? Just what effect does that have in their life? So I went and looked, what other ways can we describe the word astonished or astounded? And so I found these words, amazed, shocked, flabbergasted. Now, I'm sure we've never heard the word flabbergasted in the Bible, but can you imagine for just a moment that they were flabbergasted at his teaching? For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So let's get that picture in our mind. A crowd that is amazed, listening, moved, and maybe even believing. And now enters the one who questions Jesus. The scripture says he has an unclean spirit. And again, let's hear that in the context of a first century reality and not from the context of our Hollywood sci-fi influenced culture. This is not a creature with four heads and 12 arms or someone painted red with horns, a tail and a pitchfork. This is a human being that is obviously not as astonished by what Jesus says. In fact, he is doubtful, contrary, critical. He does not like what he hears. He confronts Jesus. He wants to know what Jesus wants of them. Now, I would like you to consider for just a moment that this person sits here with us every Sunday. This person cares deeply about their church. They give money, they give time, and they want things to be just like they are or just like they remember the church being during their lifetime. They've served on the church council, they've taught Sunday school, they've sewed and they've put together quilts and layettes and school packages for the women of the church's projects, They've sung in the choir. They've helped raise the walls of the new addition. They've served as an usher, shoveled snow, worked on the float, put up the Christmas tree, gone to Sunday school, confirmation, worked in the church stand, and worshiped regularly. Have I missed anyone? Now you hear a person who you know to be devoted entirely to God speak words that call you to believe and do something that is beyond anything you have ever believed or have done. Words that call you to become and believe in such a way that is possibly the opposite of the way you've lived your life thus far. Now, for example, this may be hard for us to get our heads around, so I am going to um, try something. And this is biblical, by the way. I didn't make this up, okay? Let's imagine for just a moment that a truly devoted person of God, a person that you have grown to respect, now steps forward and says, God has chosen the year of Jubilee. On the seventh day of the seventh month, on a year divisible by seven, all debts shall be canceled and all current and future investments 
will stand at a 0% interest for seven years. I did say this was an example. But I can already see some of you shaking and maybe your blood pressure rising at just the mention of it. Can you imagine what you would look like if, you, if I had used this as an example as a reality? The convulsing might begin in our own congregation. Now the fact that some of us are able to make money and gain in from interest does not make that person filled with an unclean spirit. The fact that some of us are able to make money to gain interest does not make us a person with an unclean spirit. The unclean spirit comes into being when we can't hear the astonishing, amazing, and flabbergasting word of God. The unclean spirit comes when we are no longer willing to listen, no longer willing to learn, no longer willing to be open for new possibilities. This unclean spirit enters our families, it enters our church, it enters our community and our world. We are faced daily with opportunities for growth, but we often meet those moments with criticism and judgment because it's a bit scary at times. It is easier to complain and criticize than it is to face our fears and learn something new. And when we know exactly who we can call to share our fears, it makes us even a bit braver in our thoughts, in our, in our feelings. Like the man in the story, when those moments happen, happen when we are challenged by the, by the scary parts, the, the chances to grow, the unknowns, we too find ourselves sometimes yelling inside and sometimes yelling out loud. Have you come to destroy us? Life is challenging. Life is always changing. It has been from the moment of conception. I don't know where we get the idea that life will always be wonderful or if we do everything right, we will never be faced with challenges and disappointments. Criticism and judgment only makes life more difficult. Criticism and judgment does not give life. It does not bring joy, and it certainly does not give hope. We are all in need of hope, aren't we? There isn't a day that doesn't go by that something comes up that you sit there shaking your head and wondering why this had to happen, or feeling the pain of what has just happened, or the disappointment. We are all in need of God's shocking word of hope. We are all in need of the amazing and flabbergasting word of God's grace. We are all in need of hearing a God who continues to speak to a world that is changing and to a world that is in need of hope. I just read the other day, this happened 10 years ago, but the United Church of Christ was trying a new marketing approach and trying to get the word out about their belief and who they are. And they used this line that the title or, the, or their motto, which was God is still speaking. And the symbol that they used was a comma. I found that kind of interesting. I had to keep reading. The symbol of a comma was used because they believed this statement. Never place a period where God has placed a comma. That is to say, God continues to communicate with us today. We may not always be sure what those words are, but if we continue to come to the synagogues or come to the places of worship or gather around as a family in a community and be willing to listen, we may be surprised by the word that comes our way. You know, we just had 
an annual meeting, and at that meeting we were reviewing again that we have been challenged with a few things in the past couple years, a few building issues that have demanded our focus. Our focus has been on bricks and mortar. There's been a sense of accomplishment when we've had, when we finish these projects because we can see the immediate results of our efforts. Life here at St. Paul's is great. A beautiful new addition, a new roof, and a restored sanctuary. We had a great treasures report at our annual meeting and, and we, re we reviewed all the great building accomplishments we had made and the fact that we are paying it off. We're able to increase the pay of our staff for the next year. And we're gonna get a new coat of paint here in the sanctuary. As long as we keep the grass mowed and we have food and drink before church and we don't mess up the kitchen and we don't spill anything and we build wonderful floats and we have a Sunday school teacher in every classroom and give our offerings, the church is neat and easy. Well, it certainly is neat. But are we reflecting the shocking and the flabbergasting word of God's hope to those who walk in here, these walls? Amen. <laughs>